girl with red spikes. She lived with her beautiful big black-eyed mother and her little sister Pearl. And they lived amongst the dirt and under the trees and would eat whatever their mother stole from some nearby plantation or farm. And would walk and walk and walk searching for someone to take them in, but no one would. A blind lady did. Later, the mother found a lover who wanted them, but not the urchin. Get that thing out of my house! Get it out of my house! Get it out! Left on her porch, rebuffed and dejected. The urchin's red hair turned black, but she did not shed one tear. Just allowed the situation to live inside her, leaving its residue. It was then the urchin was left to be raised by wolves. One day in the den, the urchin heard the whispers of the wolves. How's she doing? What happened? She sure was in some kind of pain, I tell you. I think it was the stepdaughters. They never liked her. She sure was a party. I heard somebody put a roof on her. The foot of the bed had some foul-smelling herbs tied to it. That's all I know. She left them there. They ain't got nobody now. Putting her little urchin ears to the ground, she heard about the mattress of death that consumed her beautiful, big, black-eyed mother after ingesting seasonings that looked like red pepper at dinner. She also heard a stern woman's voice spinning weird tales of animal claws, swamp herbs, and miasma. The beautiful, big, black-eyed woman would never be seen or heard from again. She had truly gone home. It was then, only in the urchin solitude, that she allowed the sadness gripping her urchin heart to express. One day, a letter soon out to the now black-headed urchin gal's Aunt Mamie in New York. Come and get Eartha May before she's beaten to death, worked to death, or starved to death. I heard you go to some land that's shaped like a great big huge air, but I would go I would. I heard there were trains that fly and one line would drop on your urchin head. I I hope I hope you get some home. Dad, you go you you can't feed your little urchin body. Well, I heard everybody live on top of each other and one day the buildings stopped to tip over crushing everybody. <laughs> A truck came with clothes and instructions. Was I really going to the land shaped like a big apple? Kind of wanted to see what that looked like. <laughs> I had already battled the beast in the south. I was now at least aware of the threats in the north. We arrived at Pennsylvania Station, New York. The people there looked like ants. Scrambling, shoving, nearly knocking each other over, and there were so many of them. I stood at that ledge so long, scared to jump into the stampede. All of a sudden, out the crowd sat this ginormous woman. Black, shoulder-length hair, bangs cut straight across, high cheekbones, big, black, majestic eyes. I was transfixed. I wanted to jump inside of her belly button and just Lived there for a few months. <laughs> the sun had been so abusive to me. Life had been hard on my tiny urchin brain. I love this lady already. She looked down at me. So this is what you look like. Her soft, caramel neck came pouring down on me as she grabbed my chin. Her hands were soft, not hard like those south hands. <laughs> she looked sweet, like a date. I wanted to eat her. 
He held my hand, and I thought, was this my real mother? She held my hand firmly. I felt security for the first time in my life. There were a lot of first emotions with my aunt. Shy as a turtle, I sat in the back of the class praying not to be called on. I stared at the book as though I was deeply engaged with its contents. I didn't even know what page we were on. But I made sure not to give the teacher any eye contact. At recess, I found the coziest wall I could find and plastered myself to it. So nervous of the other kids. They were like preteen sharks and I was a guppy just trying to stay afloat. <laughs> One thing I do thank the South for is that cotton picking strength. Don't challenge me. <laughs> it's how I got into the Catherine Dunham School of Dance on a dare. I didn't have any formal dance training, but not knowing never stopped me from nothing. I figured I'd watch. Arrived at the audition ill appropriately dressed and just watched. <laughs> I had just seen Captain Dunham in stormy weather. I heard she was a noted choreographer, anthropologist, and an expert on primitive dance. There was no way I was going to pass up a chance to meet her. The outfit I was wearing did not match the outfits I was seeing. <laughs> I needed a better get up. All of a sudden, I went out of the blue, as if someone took pity on me and read my thoughts. <laughs> I decided I'd mimic what I saw. <laughs> But I couldn't resist adding a few moves of my own. <laughs> the movements being generated from my bones were seizing me. The pressures and angst of living at home with my aunt were taking hold of me, and I just wanted to release myself through dance. She wanted me to be a concert pianist. I wanted to dance and sing. She said dancing was the devil's doing. I just wanted to dance and dance and dance. When I came to, I saw all my victims laying in wait. <laughs> Miss Dunham would like to offer you a scholarship into the program. I began the semester that Monday morning. It was that kind of force that would fuel me through my whole career. I took everything I could while I was a student at the Catherine Dunham School of Dance. <laughs> Tap, ballet, trapeze, percussion, voice and speech. Anything I could to keep me away from home as long as the day was possible. <laughs> the cobra, my new word for ant, <laughs> would always have some venom to spew my way for returning home late. But I was on a mission. Why didn't she get me? Catherine Dunham. <laughs> I took notice of her ways. I adopted some of her grace. The way she presented herself to her room. I cloistered myself in my room after classes. I did not want to steal the night away with the foolishness of gathering with friends, drinking aimlessly, and for it, I was considered haughty and difficult to get along with. I was just focused. I wanted to be Dunham, <laughs> not dance under her for the rest of my life. I got good. I became one of the best at the Dunham School of Dance. I was now being asked to sing and host events. Miss Dunham loved my voice, but there was still a shade. <laughs> she did not like me. I knew it because she told me so out loud and often. <laughs> Auditions for the Catherine Dunham Dance Company arrived, and this kitty got the call. Dancer, you have too much baggage. <laughs> if you thought that, why did you pick me to be in your school then? I was put on the waiting list. It made me even more eager to join the company, to prove I was good enough. Eventually, I was accepted, and I got to see some other parts of the world Hollywood, England, <laughs> everywhere. Newspapers began to take notice. Dunham grew jealous. <laughs> I am the queen of this beehive. You should be lucky about the time you've spent with me. I am responsible for you. 
And if you dare accept a job with this in any part of this country except with this company, we'll be sure that you'll never work in Europe again. She began to be a fire-breathing dragon. <laughs> I knew my time was drawing near to strike it on a man. Don't look at me, Kitty. Your eyes penetrate my soul. <laughs> Dragons are fierce, but cats can be also. <laughs> and Arthur May was becoming Kitty Charles. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kitty Charles. I'm coming. <laughs> Tell them to hold it. <laughs> yeah, do <see> that. <laughs> Nobody taught me. I figured it out for myself. Well, you never get nowhere counting on somebody else. <laughs> when I was in first grade, just a week, I gave the other kitties a course in Greek. At sweet 16, I was busily employed, explaining the theories of Sigmund Freud. Nobody taught me. Figured it out for myself When I found out what I could mean to men My education started all over again It really doesn't matter if you're rich or poor A millionaire who loves you can make you feel secure Nobody taught me I figured it out for myself Gavin in Las Vegas broke the bank three times I went to Hialeah, had the boogers bomb and dimes. Nobody taught me, I figured it out myself. Well, you never get nowhere counting on somebody else. I was sued by J.P. Morgan, all control of the bank. They awarded me the verdict, I had just myself to thank. The case was well conducted, as the judge can plainly see. Call it self-defense because the lawyer was me. Nobody taught me, I figured it out myself. and it is cutthroat. I learned skills, shows, travel. Miss Dunham taught us to be aware of the cameras and aware of the vulgarity that they could color us with if we were captured in the wrong moments. Always be aware of yourself. You're part of an elite group now. Performing with the group in Paris, someone took notice of me and offered me my first solo gig. That was the end of me and Dunham. The dragon wanted all of her marionettes to remain under her, never to outshine her. She held tight to her control. I was the only one smart enough to escape the beast, never to return. This is a sad reminder. Bill, my husband, or rather, 
the seed that helped me born my child. Or no, 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 no. Was he the itch I couldn't scratch? <laughs> no, 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 no. The cough I couldn't shake. And no, no, I got it. A hiccup. Bill was a hiccup. And hiccups need a body to live. Enter Eartha Kitt, age 40, with a grandfather clock ticking inside of her. I was not in love with Bill McDonald. I didn't even desire him. However, I did have a liking towards him, which is why I allowed him to get closer. Hiccup. <laughs> he had a girlfriend at the time we met, whom I never thought right for him, but that's who I was to Bill, the girl who would evaluate other girls for him. <laughs> Hiccup. I wanted my child to be born with the wit of Arthur Lowe, the mind of Charles Revson, the mystery of Ruby Rosa with a strong soul like Josh White. Bill was a sneaky one. <laughs> Hiccups are sneaky. <laughs> a wounded soldier with his mind in the gutter, still out in the battlefield somewhere. A sweet soul, just too extreme at times, always bursting into places I was, writhing on the floor, threatening, screaming to the heavens, I will kill myself if she does not marry me! I felt like I had this around my neck our entire marriage. <laughs> Love. It can take a strange hold over you, making you think without acting, making you act without thinking. I kept Bill around because I had a plan, a vision. Not using him, I was simply giving him what he wanted, me. And in return, concentrating on what I wanted, a baby, a family. Something I never had. My daughter Kit was conceived on a boat. We took a private sunset cruise across the marina and I knew I wanted my baby to be conceived in the water. At least that is the story I've come up with in my mind. <laughs> <sighs> Arthur Lowe. My kit would have been filled with so much wit. Charles Revson. My kit could have been heiress to the great <laughs> cosmetic throne. Or <laughs> Ruby. Mi amor. My kit could have been half Spanish. <laughs> Even Josh White. <laughs> and contrary to popular opinion, I was never going to marry Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> I have never dated either of the Nicholas brothers. <laughs> and I have never, ever, ever caught the blues from Mr. St. Louis Blues, Nat King Cole. <laughs> Although he was very sweet and we grew to be very good friends. And the wife steps in <laughs> and writes you a nasty letter saying that if you do not cut ties with her husband, she will cut you. <laughs> I was not up for that battle. Especially over a man that isn't even mine. No, no, no. <laughs> I shared an evening with Harry Belafonte. In the morning, he told me, careful not to get too attached. <laughs> the only thing a black woman can do for a black man is hold him back. <laughs> I'd like to tell a little story that's been told time and time again about the foolish men who chase me, my discarded men. <laughs> they used to tell me they loved me, but I knew better than them. I'd find them looking around the corner. My discarded men. <laughs> Telephone calls in the evening. They drive me around the bend. Caviar, champagne, and roses are from my discarded men. <laughs> <sighs> They were all very sweet, 
But. <laughs> Chase me after a fashion. I could never pretend. No substitute for passion. My discarded men. <laughs> I like to dress up in sequins and treat myself now and then. <laughs> Perhaps I'll give a little favor to one of my discarded men. <laughs> Hey, handsome. <laughs> <laughs> you think you can throw me and be my special friend? Just take a tip from the others. <laughs> <laughs> it was all magic when it started. <laughs> I went all through Switzerland with your voice haunting me on the radio. I made it my mind to look you up when I got home. I loved Arthur Lowe. Arthur provided consolation when I was nervous. Love when I was sad, humor when I was afraid. Always tipping buckets of tears from my eyes with the sweetness. The first time he walked me home, he didn't want to leave. Don't go to bed. I'm tired. <laughs> he slept on the sofa that night. I woke up with a sleeping pale face in my living room. That's what I called him, my pale face. He called me Earthy. He left in the morning, but was back for lunch. <laughs> Our first date was coffee and burgers. <laughs> we became inseparable. Love. And it didn't come from an audience this time. Arthur threw me a party for my birthday one year. For me? <laughs> the tiniest angel riding on three clouds of freshwater pearls. You may want to be evil, but I think you're an angel. He called me every day. I was so happy to be missed. He visited weekly. He ignited my funny bone with his Hollywood banter. I love to hear him ping pong words around. Warm, lovable, kind. Our lonely hearts captured one another and made the perfect partnership. Time was right, the fate was right, and the man. <laughs> Earthy, don't go away. I have to get dressed. I have a show and I'm not fit. Come back. Welcome back. Earthy. <laughs> Argentines without means do it. People say that Boston beans do it. Let's do it. Let's fall in love. Old Cape Cod clams, gangster wish. Do it. Even lazy jellyfish do it. Oh, wow. 
song until dum da dum dum the thing stepped in. It's Arthur's mother. <laughs> what a cold bag of blood and bones that one was. Looking through her crystal ball, she managed to find out the exact time and place Arthur and I were to be meeting for dinner. Had someone delay me on a very important meeting with my love, making him think I disrespected him and didn't care about his feelings. I would never do that. I could never do that. Arthur should have known I would never do anything to hurt him. Mothers of pale faces. <laughs> Don't like their sons mingling with whom they consider to still be the hired help. She made me feel rather evil. <laughs> I want to be evil. I want to spit tacks. I want to be evil and cheat at chance. Some dissipation in my face. I wanna be evil. I want to be mad. That's more than this. I want to be bad. I want to be evil and trumpet ace. Just to see my partner's face. I wanna be nasty. I want to be cruel, I want to be daring, I want to shoot the pool, and in the theater, I want to change my seats, just so I can step on everybody's feet. I want to be evil, I want to hurt flies, I want to sing songs like the guys who Thank <laughs> you. 
not in the traditional way of teaching, but by doing and demonstration. He did, I watched. He talked, I listened. Never miss an opportunity to shut up. You just might learn something. And from Orson, I did. The word is the world. <laughs> I sat numb in his presence, left speechless at his speeches. He was the player and I was the play-doh, ready to be molded. <laughs> Rehearsing with Orson was an all-night affair. Hungry little, hungry little trouble. Down to damned in a bubble. Yearning to, yearning to be. <laughs> be or be free, all that you see is all about me. Hungry little me. Orson Welles taught me stage passion and belief in oneself. Command the stage with your aura. Immerse yourself in the play. And afterwards, lavish dinners after midnight, conversations, debates, and Shakespeare. <laughs> Make me a willow cabin at your gate mm -hmm. and call upon my soul within the house. Write loyal cantons of contemnate love and sing them loud even in the dead of night. Hallo your name to the reverberate hills and make the babbling gossip of the air cry out. Ertha. <laughs> you shall not rest between the elements of air and earth, but you should pity me. Hungry little trouble. Down in a bubble. Yearning to be, be or be free. All that you see is all about me. Hungry little me. Is this the face that launched a thousand ships? <laughs> <laughs> Helen. Immortal with a kiss. This night, he had this savage look in his eyes. And when I leaned in to give him what he wanted, Faust bit me like I was dinner. <laughs> Hungry little trouble. <laughs> and I stayed on stage. <laughs> Damned in a bubble. Blood trickling down my lip. <laughs> Times its size. <laughs> it is all about me. Hungry little me. As soon as this curtain closed, <laughs> I was at his neck. Why did you bite me? I don't know, I just felt it. <laughs> and he sculpted off like the little devil he just was. <laughs> Orson's version of Faust was no doubt different than any version anyone has ever seen before. But that's Orson. And no, he was never my man. Any reports of such are just bird food <laughs> for the chirpers. <laughs> My daughter, my love. 
would play stupid, silly little games together, share secret moments. But she was sold to leave me too. In my solitude, you haunt me. Since you were born, you've gone everywhere with me. Now that this man is in your life, it's like I'm being given away again. Like, all right, that's it. Thanks for the womb and the years of life that you took care of me. Hong Kong, move it, lady! <sighs> Kate, <coughs> my daughter, my love. I know, I'm only kidding. You'll have to forgive me. I'll be making terrible jokes. Jokes and puns all day. I think I'm entitled as I am a mother about to lose her only child. Her only child! I knew when I met Mr. Charles Lawrence Shapiro, I knew. I knew this is a man who's going to take my daughter away from me. The only person who belongs to me who is of me. The only real family I've got. Oh, yes, well, that is cliche, my dearest. I didn't want a son. Thanks, son. I am truly happy for you. You know, your first word was gotta. I was sick hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, I'm saying nothing. Just moving my mouth to keep my thoughts occupied. <sighs> yes, it is beautiful. You. I hope he and his family do not keep you so occupied that you won't even need me anymore. No more, no more. Pity party done. Let me look at you. You are radiantly beautiful, my dear. I've often heard <coughs> you've had the eyes, the face, the length, and all that to him. Made it in this crazy business of mine. It is a very difficult thing to be a part of. It takes lots to sustain, leaves you lonely, lots of heartbreaks. Don't listen to me, I'm rambling. <laughs> on me being a part of every detail of the wedding. She wanted me around for all the festivities, not to mention paying for the damn thing. <laughs> yeah. Mother, you know the mother of the bride pays for everything. How should I know that? Well, I didn't have a mother. Nobody gave me away when I was married. My daughter kid was just trying to have a wedding. I was dealing with my own issues. 
The issues I've always dealt with. Not having a mother. Rejection. I held in so many tears the day of the wedding. I had a bottle of gum for my table only for others to consume. I couldn't eat a bean on the very expensive dinner plate I paid for. <laughs> they will understand you taking a leave. Leave, Doc, no. This is my first shot at Broadway. I can't let them know that I'm ill. I'm told it will cost Leonard Silman's company $20,000 a week for me to take such rest. I have to get me a different doctor. Hmm. One that would get me what I wanted. Enter Dr. Wonder. And I heard wonderful things about him. I heard he was great with entertainers. He knew how to have them off their backs and on stage in no time. All he had to do was eject you twice a week, and you're on stage in five minutes. <laughs> Mr. Hazel. She's so sweet. Something in my gut told me I should stop going to him. <laughs> that night, the curtains closed prematurely on the show. I was carried out to a room, laid on a cot, and when I came to, there was Dr. Wonder hovering over me. No! No, no! That is not! I hate you! Everyone in the room thought I was crazy, but my gut telling me that man was the devil I had just been singing about! Whatever he was injecting into me, it wasn't vitamins. He later lost his license and was thrown into prison for malpractice. 
I was tired. Overworked. Shots of real vitamin K injection still didn't help. Being demanded and stretched all the time. And asked to do more and more and more. In the interest of other people. It began to be too much. I was closing the curtain on myself. <laughs> I drove down to the ocean. Parked my car. Got out. The water. She called to me. She loved me. The waves massaged my neck and my back. Earth I was home. Lost in a sea of uncertain serenity. overlooking his garden. Come on, buddy. Why would such a young thing want to meet an old brute like me? I read your biography and I want you to explain it to me. Especially the whole theory of relativity business. E equals MC squared. You don't need to understand any of that nonsense. But I wanted to know. I needed something to hold on to. Knowledge. And I wanted it now. You must curb your impatience, my dear. So we sat. Overlooking the Princeton Towers. Overlooking some birds that had flown up from a nearby aviary. Glided around in the air a bit. And returned. Bertha. I felt the call of my intellect getting ready to be massaged. You could actually see the energy radiating off of him as he spoke. They do this every time at the same time each day. It is a pity we human beings do not have the same discipline. He chatted away. Him speaking raised the hairs on my head. I felt so filled, so light. I was being given a lesson, a wake up 101, and I was up. I was way up. I felt blessed. I went home and began to write again. Ever since that day, I did what the birds do. 
I flew. The birds fed me, gave me hope. Do what you do, your job, then you go home. Life, it's routine. And I, that day, realized that I was along for the ride. Ever since that day, I lived in the sky. And I never asked why. Once again, bad taste has been flaunted in the guy's freedom. Eartha Kitt's performance at the White House was unforgivable. Eartha Kitt could not afford to buy the front page publicity that her effrontery rate. Eartha Kitt said she spoke for millions when she behaved in a rude and stupid manner towards Mrs. Johnson. She didn't speak for anyone except hate-filled, gutless fools. <coughs> we were all shocked at her unnecessary behavior. She had a tough childhood, but so did I. I'm not crying. No, would I do a thing like that? <laughs> Contrary to popular opinion, I'm a crime fighter. So I know I set up when I see one. When I arrived at the women's doors luncheon at the White House, I was immediately pulled aside, pushed in a room, and questioned. Initially, I thought this was standard procedure. It wasn't. I was later pinned as arriving late, even though I had been there on time. <laughs> It was the agents of deception that caused me to appear careless. I was set up to appear as if I was a careless colored woman. It started there, and I aimed to finish it. <laughs> if I knew it was going to be that way, I would have dressed for the occasion. <laughs> I raised my hand when the lady bird asked my opinion. After sitting there as pristine as I possibly could, <laughs> listening to the nonsense of bringing flower pots to neighborhood ghettos, beautifying them into making them safe. What kind of logic was this? How exactly do flower pots address the problems of the guns and the drugs and the rats and the ghettos? Or the problem with juvenile delinquency or war? Yes, he set up. <laughs> and this lady bird was perfect. <laughs> oh, my cat trap. I said to the doors, you take the best of this country off to be shot and maimed. No wonder the kids rebel and take pot. They are not rebelling for no reason. They are not hippies for no reason at all. There are so many things burning the people of this country, particularly mothers. You have chickadees of your own, Lady Bird. <laughs> we raise children and we send them off to war. They said my comments made her cry. Pity! She tried to peck me first by ignoring my raised claw for the rest of the evening. <laughs> Perhaps they thought I was going to be the entertainment for the rest of the night. A foolish assumption because you see, when you mess with the cat, you get the claw. <laughs> I am entitled to my opinion, particularly when it is asked of me, and I cannot be responsible for the feelings of mere mortals. A crime was happening, heads were in the sand, reality was being overlooked, the bullshit was rising. <laughs> and this lady bird was perfect, and it seemed clear that she too was a part of the rising bullshit. Unfortunately for them, Catwoman is educated. I have become a person of influence, disguising myself as a singer and an actress, gaining considerable popularity on the third season of the Batman series, taking over for she who I will not speak her name. You know, the tall, leggy one. I was born to be who I became, Catwoman, crusader for justice. There was no way I could have sat silent. I have Kitsville, USA a sanctuary for wayward youth to give them an outlet to express themselves and not be judged. I was working extensively with a group of boys in Washington, rebels with a cause, being their liaisons to the higher ups so they could get the funds and the things necessary to do what they needed to do for their community. I was always catfighting with X-Men, 
Malcolm Little, about his way of invoking change into the world. I wanted him to join Martin in the nonviolent movement. I donated every dime for my show I did at the Apollo in Harlem to King and the cause. Martin Luther King seemed to be the only one fighting for freedom and justice for all. Unlike these agents of deception, I was heavily influenced by what was really going on. LBJ, Mr. Showtime, wanted cameras. Lady Bird wanted forced smiles and praise from the women's doers. <laughs> what an oxymoron. I didn't know I was attending a luncheon thrown by my worst enemies trying to set me up. But what they didn't realize is that cats have nine lives <laughs> and we always land on our feet. When I got the code from Martin Luther King Jr., <laughs> we are proud of you, Ertha. You did what all of America wanted you to do. We are happy someone did it for us. You should really be the one to receive the peace prize. We are proud of you, Eartha. I felt even more invincible. Thank you guys for packing the room. So.